Welcome to TLC for the Soul podcast, where soul meets spirit. You have entered into sacred space. I'm your host, Tammy Lynn Chambers, and I'm here to help you shine. Now let's get going on this podcast journey. to talk for just a moment before we get into the story about our special offers. I would like to offer for you to join me over on Scribed, if you feel called. That is a kind of a um, website like Netflix, I guess a subscription-based website like Netflix, but for audiobooks and books. And if you use the link in my show notes or in the description of this video, you get one month free of Scribed, and when you sign up for that free trial, I get one month free uh, added on to my membership. So I really enjoy Scribed. I've been able to cancel some of my other like audiobook memberships um, because Scribed has both the book ebook form and the audiobook form of many many books that you you know are wanting to read. So brand new titles and all your famous authors and so forth and I have as well now as an author all of my books are on scribed as well so when you join um, the free trial you can read any of my books for free too so again many audiobooks and ebooks there like everything I've searched for so far with the exception of one book um, has has not been available there uh, but I found everything else I've wanted to read so all the Neil Gaiman Gaimans are out there and all the other um, authors and newer titles and so forth so again use the um, link in my show notes or video description or wherever you find this podcast for your one month free trial and I hope to see you over there thank you so much take care Hello everyone, hello and welcome back to the podcast. We are in now for our second installment of Turkey Pot Pie. Um, this is chapters five through seven, so we have only are doing um, not as many today, but only because um, the chapters, the pages, <laughs> they're supposed to be page a days, but the pages seem to be getting longer. So... Um, I don't want to make the podcast go much too beyond like 30 minutes or so. So we're going to just stick with these three chapters. Now I am recording outside again and I know that there have been audio issues with especially the last podcast and I recorded that twice and I just couldn't fix the volume issues and so on and so forth. But really, I mean, I'm just doing all this for fun. So (laughs) if it was a problem, um, you know, hopefully this one sounds a little bit better. Although it is quite, quite windy today, and we've got a windsock on the microphone, but you're going to hear, you know, outdoor sounds and so forth. But I like recording outside so much more than recording inside. Um, It just has so much more of a brighter, clear energy to me to be outdoors, which is always where I kind of feel like I've done my best work is outdoors. So excuse any wind sounds that you might hear. So without further ado, I hope you are having a good month. Um, We have received drawings for the, uh, what is it, the Get Written Into the Story contest, and I will be drawing the winner um, later today. So the next time you hear this podcast, um, it will be including our our written in person, our winner of our contest. So let's go ahead. When we last left off, Dakar and Abigail were in their room at the Argyle B&B, Argyle Inn, and Dakar was like planning to go out and do some scouting around. He said looking for clues, although he wasn't really sure what he might find. And so now we join them back in Chapter 5 with the handbook. Abigail and Dakar wasted no time in getting comfortable. Within several moments of their jumping up and down on the plush duvet, there was another knock on the door. And you know, I'm going to stop right there. (laughs) I'm not even going to edit this out. What I'm going to say is, there we go again, just jumping forward without kind of... I'm always in sacred space, but I like to get us into that space together without just jumping into the story. 
So I'd like to just invite you to relax for a moment. Just let Abigail and Carson <laughs> sit there for a second as we create our own sacred space. As you get a cup of tea or coffee or something to drink or snack on as you listen to this episode. This one actually is going to get very interesting. The last chapter, it was very surprising to me. So <laughs> buckle up, kiddos. It's going to be an interesting ride to chapter seven. So let's take a deep breath together. Let's just get into the spirit of the Argyle in b and b Abigail and Dakar, calling in your own guides in your own sacred space if you desire to do so. And I have our guides and angels surrounding us. And as I always say, you can listen to this podcast with whatever intention most resonates with you. I'm not, you know, declaring that you have to set any way of listening. Um, for me, I want the full-blown experience. So, you know, there's ASMR if you want it and just the sound of my voice. There's light language downloads or activations if you choose to accept them that come through my voice. That's You just have to set the intention for that if you want it. There's potential messages for you in the story or that your guides could deliver to you as you're listening. Um, visions you might see, things you might hear or notice around you. Um, so if you want that type of experience, just call that in. And just, you know, if you want to just settle in and enjoy the story for just being a story, then that's your intention, and that's perfectly fine as well. So again, let's get back to Abigail and Dakar, getting comfortable in their room, jumping up and down like little kids on the duvet on their bed, and then there's a knock on the door. Melly wheeled in a tray of baked goods, teapot and cups, sandwiches, and a soup tureen. Enjoy, she said, slipping out the door before they could ask for anything else. My, this looks delicious, Abigail said, taking the wrap off the sandwiches and opening the lid to the soup. I haven't eaten since breakfast, she sighed, knowing that often she got so caught up in the moment that she forgot to nourish herself. I'll have some of that soup, Dakar said, smelling the baked potato cream soup wafting into the room. But first I want to look around this place for a moment. Must you, Abigail said. He must be exhausted from the travel. I'm tired, Dakar said, but I want to see what this place is all about. I won't go outside tonight, though, he said, kissing her lightly on the top of the head. That's for making me feel like a child again, he said, opening the door to room 251 and peeking down both sides of the hallway. He slipped quietly out the door and padded down the hallway in his wool socks. He was trying to remain inconspicuous, but as luck would have it, he ran straight into Maggie Chalmers. Maggie was up making her nightly rounds, if they could truthfully be called that. She made this same excuse every evening and often didn't make it back to her room until dawn. She hadn't expected anyone to be around, and she had forgotten about the guests arriving that night. Well, well, hello, she said, admiring Dakar's form. We haven't been introduced, she said, holding up her hand. Dakar, always the gentleman, kissed the back of her hand with a regal charm and held it a little longer than necessary. He wasn't sure what he saw in the dimly lit hall. Maggie Chalmers appeared almost ghostly. She was so pale, almost etheric that he would have thought her a ghost except for the touch of her hand in his. And who are you, Maggie said, leaning in closer to Dakar. I'm Dakar, he said, feeling heady at the touch of her. She had a way of looking into his eyes that unnerved him. All the thoughts of Abigail went out of his mind and he stood looking down at her. Maggie, although powerful and stern as she was, appeared smaller than her powerful aura made her out to be. Her head came to the top of Dakar's shoulder, and he could smell the sweet perfume she had spritzed around her. It was hypnotic. Guests don't usually come out of their rooms at night, Maggie smiled up at him. Dakar couldn't really hear anything around him except for Maggie's lilting voice. It seemed to be leading him somewhere, but to where he wasn't sure. 
he called in for his dragon familiar Lancelot and asked for support. Lancelot appeared in the form of a fire dragon and blew out a huff of red smoke around Dakar. Maggie hissed almost at the sight of it and dropped Dakar's hand. Sleep well, she said, disappearing into the shadows. Dakar thanked his guide as his senses began to return. He felt like he had a hangover and there was a strange feeling in his hand, almost like someone or something had bitten him on the back of his hand. He looked and saw two small marks on it. He made a mental note to check in with headquarters once he was done walking around. He moved swiftly down the other end of the hall and approached an old vintage cupboard with antique gilding and a small lock on the door. He moved his hand quickly in front of the lock and with intention the lock yielded to the, his command to open. The inside of the cupboard was bare, with the exception of an old bound book with a hand and eye on the cover. Dakar picked up the book and turned it over. Written on the back were the words, El Handbook de los Santos. The book seemed warm to him, inviting him in, just like Maggie, he thought. Alright, having to edit out various bouts of sneezing. Just like Maggie, he thought. He wasn't sure he wanted to open it, so he stored a memory of the cover in his mind's eye and placed the book back in the cupboard, reattaching the lock. He moved back towards room 251, but not before he heard a scream coming from room 245. He rushed over to the door, putting his ear against the old oak of it, and he listened. But you promised, he heard a female voice say in an almost sing-song tone. <clears throat> well, promises are meant to be broken, he heard a male voice say in a commanding tone, and then silence. Dakar felt strange inside and was guided to move towards his room. His guides were finally pitching in and he thanked them for showing up. Dakar put a hand to the knob of room 251, just in time to hear Maggie Chalmers laugh a wicked and sinister wail of a laugh that filled the corridor with a dark feeling. And then he heard it something he would never forget. A soul was being sucked dry of its life force. And then he collapsed. All right, so I had to pause this yet again. So I just want to speak to that for just a second. I don't typically break in, although sometimes I do when I'm reading, I just put my own perspective on this. But um, just feeling a restless restlessness. <laughs> in the collective right now as I'm recording this. So if you're feeling a little bit of restlessness, like you have to get up and move, pause the record or pause the podcast and do something, you know, change locations. Like I had to change locations, which I've never really had to do before. Um, then just honor that, you know, it's not, we're not trying to be perfect. And that's a lot of what I'm being shown to as I do a lot of my creative work is it does not have to be perfection. You know, the podcast does not have to be a sound production in a sound booth with a perfect microphone and all of these other things. Because I'm telling you, my best recordings, my best channelings were done outside with so many distractions. I had like jet planes flying overhead and, you know, people wandering around and an unruly dog and all of that. So I just think that this, I'm being guided to tell everyone if you choose to accept this, if you resonate with this or not, just to kind of lighten up a little bit. It's all going to be okay. Um, and even as we go into these chapters, which get a little bit, again, it gets, you know, a little bit dark and I am recording this. Um, oh, so interesting what's happening now too. I'll tell you all in a moment. It's getting a little bit dark um, in terms of Scorpio season and things happening. So, you know, just honor your feelings. If you're guided to, you know, turn this off and come back later or whatever, you know, just kind of honor that for yourself and um, what's showing up for you as you're listening to this. Because these are kind of timeless recordings, but I did just want to break in and kind of say that <laughs> before the exciting part. Um, where Dakar collapses <laughs> uh, and we think of Dakar as like um, you know such a strong <clears throat> a strong energy 
and he was kind of painted, painted, his spirit kind of channeled him in as this um, very unnerving force in um, on our October story. Um, but he kind of disappeared, and we don't really know where he went. I'm not saying that he's like a dark force. I, I don't believe that at all. But I think um, Spirit just wants to show us that he's fallible. He's not perfect. He's, um, he's in fact, got quite a bit of um, shadow work to do, which is why um, he has Abigail in his life to kind of help balance him out. Um, so I just, I'm just being guided to say all these things. So... Again, I really like being able to interject a little bit with some of the um, what's being channeled through me by spirit as I'm actually doing the recording. So if that's unnerving to you or whatever and you just want to hear an audiobook, um, it's probably not going to be the best podcast for you. But um, if you're, you know, jiving, <laughs> you like all this, um, then stick around. And I promise I won't do it too, too often because I do like to get lost in the story myself as well. But I'm just being guided to kind of pop in and say a couple of things here. So let's get on with this. Let's get on to chapter six. We have Dakar collapsed on the outside the door of his room. Chapter six is sad beginnings lead to sad endings. Dakar sat up quickly as he came back into his body. He had been dreamwalking and it wasn't a pretty place he had been shown. He breathed deep into his body as Abigail wiped his forehead with a wet washcloth. Dakar, you had me scared to death, she said, her hand shaking. Dakar took her hand in his and kissed it. My love, what happened, he asked, not wanting to share anything with her just yet. I found you outside the door, passed out. At at least I think you passed out, she said, looking at the two marks on the back of Dakar's hand. You have these weird marks on your hand and you were muttering about some handbook, she said, feeling anxious. Dakar, what happened? She asked, not knowing for sure if she really wanted to know. I met our proprietress, Maggie Chalmers, he said, and then I don't recall what happened after that, he said, eyeing the red wound on his hand. It looks like something bit you, Abigail said. I'm scared a little. I heard strange voices, and then I heard you fall down outside the door, although I didn't know it was you at first, she said. I heard you talking like you were talking in your sleep sometimes, she said, filling him in. It's okay, he said, sitting up now. Let's eat first, and then I'll try to remember more of what I saw or heard. He said, hoping he could recall it. He reached into his sweater pocket and realized his wand was missing. Well, that's not good, he thought, debating about whether to stay the night or not. But Dakar didn't scare that easily. He was a little out of sorts, but he always bounced back. He stood up now and picked a sandwich from the dinner cart, smelling it before he took a bite. Seems safe, he thought, as he took a bite and rejoined Abigail. How did you get me in here, he asked her. The car was almost twice Abigail's size. She was strong, but not strong enough to lift him by herself. I rang for the front desk, she said. When I found you there, I kind of panicked. I know we said we should call our guides in first, but I thought this was more of a priority to see what happened to you and to get you inside the room, she said. Well, we'll figure all that out later, Dakar said, seeing his mind's seeing his mind's eye as it showed him the back cover of a book that said El Hanbuk de los Santos. He said the name out loud. What is that? Abigail said, feeling that she had heard that name somewhere. I'm still trying to piece it all together, he said, rubbing the back of his hand and suddenly smelling Maggie's perfume. I have to go out again, he said. What? Abigail was perplexed. You most certainly will not, she said. I'm calling in our guides right now. You stay put, please, she said, closing her eyes and reaching out into the astral to call Polly. Within minutes, the older witch had astral projected herself into the room. My, my, dear, Polly said, eyeing Dakar. What have you gotten yourself into here, she said, feeling the darkness surround her. At that, all the lights in the room extinguished, and Abigail heard Dakar protest. The lights came back on, and Dakar was gone. Polly, Abigail said in a panic, not again, she said at the sight of the missing Dakar. My dear, Polly said, you must leave this place at once. You cannot handle this alone, the older witch said, seeing the danger around the younger girl. I am not leaving Dakar again, Abigail said. Please send me reinforcements. I am staying here until I find a car, and the first thing I'm going to do is find this El Handbook de los Santos, she said, her inner strength kicking in. Not that book, Polly said, but Abigail would not be 
swayed. Please send me a helper, was all Abigail said, before releasing Polly back into the ethers with a sweep of her hand. Not another mission without Dakar, Abigail thought to herself. He is so going to owe me. Let's get ready for chapter seven, the basement. I do want to just pop in again. I think I might do this at the end of the chapters if there's if there is anything to say. Sometimes there's not. But as I was reading chapter six, I felt um, like my guardian angel guide kind of step in behind me. He's a very masculine, very powerful um, energy. He is um, also my divine counterpart, um, but he just kind of his higher self just kind of pops in. Um, it was so very strong, like over my left shoulder, kind of behind me, kind of just like putting a hand on my shoulder, like, you know, I've got your back, kind of a, kind of a feeling. So I don't know if any of you experienced, you know, one of your guides stepping in more strongly, um, in or around you, but that was just very palpable to me. And I think I kind of like laughed a little bit as I was reading, cause I just felt, um, him there behind me. So very cool. <laughs> You know, and you don't, and they're, they're guiding me to say, like, if you don't know who your guides are, like, just ask for, and, and you're interested, like, you don't have to, again, you just be here for the story, but if you're interested, you don't know who any of your guides are, you're wanting to meet a new guide, you just ask, we're in sacred space, everything is protected, you're perfectly safe, and call in a new guide, you know, someone to, who wants to work with you, maybe somebody you haven't worked with before, um, just ask for someone to come who, who you most need in this now for whatever you're going through walking through on your journey you know just ask for to be supported just like Abigail did just like Descartes did in that last chapter you know they, they asked for their guides to surround them when they were feeling you know unsure you know needed some protection um, Abigail's like I need reinforcements right now um, for the work that I have to do she's not even sure what she has to do so just ask for support if you need it I think is what is being conveyed here so this is the last chapter I do have to kind of not, not necessarily spoiler alert but I was very very surprised as I channeled this chapter that's all I'm gonna say and it's called the basement Dakar came to and felt the bump on the back of his head those dirty tricksters he thought to himself he had a rope around his ankles and someone or something had tied the other end to the wall it wasn't as if he couldn't use his hands to untie the rope but rather that something had energetic, energetic, oh my gosh, energetically connected him to that spot. He saw movement in the corner and a small rat scuttled by. He wasn't sure if it was friend or foe. The upstairs light shone down through the bottom of the door and Dakar considered yelling up for help, but decided against it. Chances are they're all in on this anyway. He chided himself for not being more careful and then at second thought, wondering if this was all part of the divine plan. Get him away from Abigail so he could figure it out on her so she could figure it out on her own and build her confidence, so to speak. But he didn't want her muddling around in this mess right now. It felt too sinister. A cold hand touched his and he heard sniffing. Soft hair touched the back of his neck and he could smell her. Maggie was around him and all within his field. She delighted in the scent of him, fear mixed with bravery and seduction. It seized at her and she wanted him more than ever now. She must feed off him as it always was. The Argyle depended on her, and she it, and the price to pay had been to give herself over to the spirits there, to let them take her into what the darkness needed her to be. Maggie sniffed again and then licked Dakar's neck. I've never met anyone like you before, she said, whispering in his ear. I must have you. She pounced, and Dakar was thrown back by the full force of her. I'll go willingly, he said, breathing heavier now, the unwitting becoming the wiser to this game. I'll give you everything you want and more, he said, slipping his shirt off and allowing her to touch him. Maggie had changed now in the darkness, slipping into her wolf form and Dakar following suit shape-shifting into his own wolf's clothing. He grabbed her by the neck and bit down hard. Maggie Chalmers writhed in pleasure. She needed this night, she thought, none the wiser to the plan. 
Dakar mounted her from behind and before entering her whispered into the soft folds of her wolf ear, I love you, Maggie. She recoiled and ran back into the shadows. She wiped the sweat from her brow and felt something funny stinging her chest. No fair, she said, looking down to see a bloody gash over her heart. But Maggie was not so easily swayed. She shifted again into a male form and grabbed a car, throwing him over her shoulder, carrying him up and out the basement stairs and into the darkness outside. Damn her, Dakar thought to himself. His energy was waning from the blow to his skull and he called in protection to assist. A large red dragon appeared beside him and blew out fire smoke at the man form. Nothing. The skin of the man Maggie had become seared on the left arm, but still she did not drop him. Maggie carried Dakar towards the woods at the edge of the inn, the moonlight lighting a path into the trees. Dakar knew he must act now before she got him into the trees. He reached out and grabbed her hard around the neck, squeezing down on the jugular. So you want to play? Well, all right then, Maggie said, shifting back into her wolf form. She wanted him as a man and for, and for her dark project. She needed him in all ways, and she was not going to be swayed. Dakar shifted back to his wolf self and grabbed her by the neck, leading her towards the small lake he had seen when they arrived. Maggie wondered what way he would use to satisfy her. She didn't have to wait long. Dakar shifted into a merman and jumped into the water, beckoning her to follow. Maggie didn't like the darkness under there, but she wanted Dakar more. She shifted into a mermaid and jumped in, diving deep to follow him. He stayed low and out of sight at the bottom, waiting for her to join him. He had the advantage in the water and he knew it. She found him and wrapped her mermaid tail around his. I've got you, she said, feeling more playful and free than she had in years. The water washing away some of her malevolent charms. And I you, Dakar said, lifting his hand and pulling her down onto him. He inhaled the water of Blue Pond Lake and relished in its powers. You're going to like this, he said, filling her up with the water by breathing it into her pale blue mouth. He pushed at her now, letting the water enter her. For some strange reason, she was shifting back, but she didn't want to, not yet. She couldn't breathe down there as herself. She sputtered and coughed as Maggie, the water filling her lungs. She writhed in the power of the water that came over her. She moved off of him, but couldn't release from the power of him. She wanted him still, but not like this. He pulled her by her hair to the surface. Now will you surrender, Maggie Chalmers, he said, holding her before him. Never, she said in pain now. Well, then you forced me to this, he said, looking deep into her dark soul. I love you, Maggie Chalmers. I always have, and I always will, Dakar said in all sincerity. At the sound of the words, too painful for her to bear, Maggie slid into unconsciousness as Dakar laid her on the ground and stood up. He wiped a small tear from his eye, picking her up in his strong arms, and carried her home. So that is where we are going to stop. <laughs> Holy smokes, what is going on with Dakar? We have no idea. When I wrote that, I was like, what? Why is he telling her that he loves her? And of course, you know, it's, I don't know what it is. I, I'm not going to say because I don't know. I, I honestly have no idea where it's going. <laughs> um, but I'm just like, wait, what about Abigail? Was kind of, as I was channeling this, that was my kind of like, wait, what about Abigail? What do you mean you love Maggie? So I... <laughs> I'm right there with you going, what the heck is going on here? Um, and I loved all the shape shifting that they did. Um, I loved that he took her under the water. That was just really so cool when I was channeling it. Um, and of course, wolf shifters, I've, I've got a special um, admiration or a special bond with wolf shifters. So I really enjoyed that part as well. So I hope you all enjoyed where we're at so far. Um, next time we come to the story, we'll have a um, our contest winner involved coming in as a new um, a new person into the story, and um, you know keep that in mind for next month if you're interested in the contest. And I invite you all to stay tuned for the next chapters over on my Instagram, which is TLC Books. 
That's where I post the page a days um, so you can kind of see what's going to happen next before the audiobook version comes out. I have a feeling with the holidays we may end a little bit early this month. It may not go all the way to the end of the month, but we'll just see what happens. So thank you all for joining me here. I want to thank the guides that joined us as well. And I hope to see you all again in the next podcast episode. Take care. And now a word from our sponsor. This episode has been brought to you by the Pixies of the Scottish Moors, inviting you to step out and enjoy the sounds, the feel, and the wonders of nature. Meet them outside the Argyle Inn B&B at Blue Pond Lake, or follow them as they dance through the moors each and every night, just waiting for visitors to join them and have fun in that sacred space. So thank you for joining us. We will see you again next time. Take care.